Okay, welcome PCS members and friends to our today's PCS IBS seminar. It is a pleasure to have with us today Professor Eli Barkay from Bar Ilan University in Israel. And our scientific host today is Sergei, uh, who will introduce our speaker. Please, Sergei. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Bill, and welcome everyone uh, to another PCS seminar uh, given today by Professor Eli Barkay who actually is visiting us from Poham, where he is uh, uh, currently having some uh, fellowship. I would say, I'm not sure exactly how to call it with the APCPP. So he might uh, also uh, visit Korea in the future more frequently. Um, Ellie did his um, uh, master and PhD in 94 and 98 at the Tel Aviv University and the School of Physics and Astronomy, I guess, with Victor Turok. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then uh, he moved on uh, for a postdoc at the MIT. Uh, then he had, uh, was holding an assistant professorship at the University of Notre Dame. And then he returned back to Israel to Bar Ilan University, where he's since a full professor um, since 2000. Well, he, he returned in 2007 and then rose through the ranks and is a full professor at this university. He has an impressive uh, record of publications and scientific achievements, a long list of awards and academic honors, which I will not read here right now. But uh, if anyone wants, I can show you the list, which I have here. But I want to maybe mention um, a few of the topics which he is working on. Uh, he has a very broad um, uh, research agenda, which ranges from uh, fractional kinetic framework and anomalous transport in dynamical systems to single molecule spectroscopy, weak, weak ergodicity breaking, but not the weak ergodicity breaking which we are discussing, my friends, but it's a bit of a different one. Uh, but also, then again, ergodic statistical mechanics, um, photon counting statistics for single molecule spectroscopy, first detection problem in quantum mechanics, blinking quantum dots. Uh, and uh, in more general quantum optics, statistical mechanics, chemical physics, and quantum theory. So quite a broad, uh, quite a broad spectrum. And today he will speak about the quantum first second time problem. Ellie, the floor is yours. Let's welcome our speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, most of my work is actually classical, but today I'm going to talk about a quantum problem called the quantum first hitting time problem. Um, so before I start, uh, I want to discuss very uh, generally uh, some concept of uh, search. Um, I'm searching for the light. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. So uh, imagine that you are in a room and you lose your keys. You don't know where your keys are. And you start from this point. Now, maybe when you want to search for this uh, object as a classical a walker or classical guy, you would look in a very deterministic fashion and find out your where 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 did you lose your object? You find out here. This, of course, type of deterministic type of motion is uh, a, means that you have some uh, some mind and that you have some uh, memory where you were already, so you don't revisit points. And it also means that you are using energy. Uh, from the outside in order to reach the target in a kind of a very efficient way. Um, we will show later that with, if at the end of the talk, I'm not sure I'll have talked that you can design a quantum system that do, does something like this. We call it Dirac search, um, but this will be very end of the talk if I reach it. On the other hand, in nature, a, a, a usual random walk can be also a search mechanism. So for example, you have a molecule diffusing in space and it starts somewhere and it reaches the other point. Now, random walks we use the search. They are used, for example, in chemical reactions, molecule one meets molecule B. Uh, the, 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 the random walk is not efficient in the sense that it resamples uh, places that it visited many times. So in that sense, it's not necessarily a fast search, but it is very efficient from two points of view. First of all, from any starting point, uh, you will reach your target with probability one, that's important. And 
you don't need to invest energy in order to go from here to there. This is coming from the heat bus. Uh, for example, the problem of how you reach life, it comes from a sperm coming to an egg. It's a kind of a random process. So most of you are here because of this random search. Now, when we deal with, class, with quantum problem, the first problem with search is there is no path. There is no quantum path because the particle is described by a wave function. So we will have to introduce a kind of path and we do this uh, through measurements. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And then we can define uh, the time you start from some place and reaching some place. This is going to be in the quantum world, the random time. That's called the heating time, first passage time. And this distribution of this time is what is important for, for my point of view. And this will be the subject of the talk. So uh, before I introduce the heating time, let us just discuss briefly quantum uh, walks. What I mean by this quantum walks is essentially any kind of height binding quantum dynamics. So I have some kind of graph um, and the graph has uh, some uh, vertices, uh, which I labeled zero, one, two, three, et cetera. And these uh, connections here, uh, these describe uh, hopping rates between uh, nearest neighbors, for example, but you can have also jumps to next nearest neighbors. Now, I'll talk about spatial graphs, but these can represent also states in Fox space and many body uh, physics, etc. You can have a, a finite system and you can have an infinite line, for example, and the Hamiltonian is given here below, it just uh, jumps to nearest neighbors. Uh, of course, this is an Hamiltonian, but I'm going to call it a quantum walk because you see here amplitude of jumps between some uh, points of view. From my point of view, this tight binding model is a quantum walk uh, because you hop between near some points on this graph. Um, so uh, an example of an experiment of this is done with waveguides and experiments by uh, the group of Johann Silberberg from the Weizmann. So you have waveguides and then you have a quantum propagation, and you solve the Schrodinger equation here with hopes to nearest neighbors. And here you see the solution of the Schrodinger equation uh, on this type of lattice when the initial condition is a delta function on the origin. And what you see here is the wave function, the solution of the Schrodinger equation given by some Bessel functions. They are spreading out ballistically and you have these two peaks. And this is of course very different than a random walk where you will have here a Gaussian propagator. So you have here some kind of destructive interference in the middle. And experimentalists can measure these type of quantum walks. You, you, you repeat the experiment many, many times, you reconstruct the wave function modulo squared. And this is done in this experiment. So you see it here. Um, you see uh, this peak corresponding to this peak this peak corresponding to this peak. And this is very standard in quantum dynamics and uh, seen in many experiments. What I'm interested more or less in, in this experiment, so you see, I want to know when will the particle reach for the first time this place, more or less, but we need to define what does it mean? When will the particle reach here for the first time? Um, so uh, we need to introduce a measurement protocol to define the first heating time. The first time you start at some place, x0, and reach this xm. xm is a measure from m for the measurement point. Uh, we can discuss different initial conditions and different measurements, but I'll, I'll focus about localized initial condition and localized uh, measurements. So how do we do this? We have this graph. This is describing the unitary dynamics with this Hamiltonian that represent the graph. And we have the experimentalist over here, and she's measuring on one node of the graph. And the measurement that I'm going to talk today is called the stroboscopic measurement. What it means is the following. Every tau units of time, you ask, uh, will the uh, particle be detected at this site? The answer is yes or no. So you have a sequence of measurements, no, 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 and then a yes. This yes is going to be a random time where you get the first hitting. Then once you get the yes, you stop the experiment, and then the random hitting time is n. This is the entry of this yes, n times tau. That's the time till the first hitting. 
In between the measurements, you will have unitary dynamics defined by the Hamiltonian. And so you have unitary dynamics measurement, unitary dynamics measurement. Now the measurement is going to be a strong measurement and it's going to be a, only the question, is the particle here or not, or not, yes or no? And the questions we ask is, will you get a yes? Sometimes maybe there's no yes till, uh, one second, there's no yes uh, for, forever. You can get the seconds of no infinite number of no's. That's the, called dark states. We'll discuss them a little bit. And if you get a yes, what is the distribution of the time till you get the yes? These are the questions. Yes, please. Yeah, so, so you are making this measurement, but the follow-up is the wave function at least on the node, right? Right. But also affects dynamics. So I wonder sure. how, how quantum is it really? Because it seems to me that now the unitary applied in between is just transforming the problem into just some stochastic matrix. It's right. only fundamentally classical. So no, it's it's fundamentally not classical, Okay. Uh, but it is not totally quantum. It's between the combination of the unitary and the measurement. But to try and answer the question is the following. Uh, you notice here that I just detect locally. Mm -hmm. I could do something else. I could measure the position operator of the particle. The position operator will say, okay, first measurement I detect here, then I detect there, then I detect, let's say here, there, and then eventually I arrive here for the first time. If you measure with the position operator, not with the local measurement, then the results are much more uh, classical. All right. So okay. it, 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 what you measure is important, but uh, kind of like a partial collapse. Of but it, uh, by the way, also the measurement of the position operator is not is not uh, totally classical, and I'll explain now why. One reason is, for example, if you take tau to be too small, you get nothing, but that's because of the Zeno limit. So the Zeno limit is a quantum effect. Uh, so, so, so I would say any measurement is not classical, but it's a mixture of measurements and, uh, but, but the Zeno limit is here forever. Uh, I'll talk about the Zeno limit a little bit. Uh, the measurement you're doing, uh, how can we sure that the particle never arrived before? No, it, we cannot. It, it arrives and it collapses. So right, right. So in quantum mechanics, there's a famous paper by Akira Aronov, who the title is more or less, we cannot define arrival times. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm not doing that. I don't know if the particle was in the location of this detector before. This is a, a non-defined question. I can detect, I can say when is the first detected time. Okay, Only so it can be uh, during yeah. the start down period, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it can okay. be anywhere here inside. And just repeating, I cannot, in a classical measurements, I can take tau to zero and continuously measure. This we cannot do here. Now, this problem was not invented by me. It was invented uh, uh, by famous paper by Ambianes et al. Uh, and then uh, Kruv and Broom, for example, uh, uh, they, they promoted this in the context of so-called quantum computing and quantum search. For example, these people, they took a cube, but not in the three dimension, in, in D dimension, D is a 45 or something like that. And they showed that if you start here and you measure here uh, on the diagonal of the cube, then the measurement, uh, the time it will take you to go from here to here, the first click is very fast if you compare the quantum walk to the classical random walk. So based on this measurement, uh, this uh, model, at least on the cube, they could see that in some cases you have kind of constructive interference that the transfer of information from these two sides on the very huge graph is very fast and that would considered by them as some quantum advantage of quantum search. More generally, we will see that the quantum search, uh, that means a fast detection time is not happening in general. Sometimes the quantum search is very, very bad because of, it's not surprising because of destructive interference. Sometimes it's very good because of constructive interference. And this field tries to understand when is the quantum advantage and when is there is a disadvantage. Um, I'm going to discuss a little bit some uh, work related to Grunbaum et al, these uh, mathematicians that showed some relation to topology. Abhishek Dow from I I ICTS, he considered mainly the Zeno limit where you can map this problem into a non-Hermitian uh, uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, I will not discuss, all, there are much more works. So I just want to say that uh, there, there is some activity in this field, yes. So another question. So 
In which sense is it quantum search? Because we are searching for something, you hope to find it and land where it's, let's say, it's position, but here it's just like measuring speed of transfer it's, information. Uh, okay, so for, for me, uh, search, if I, I started my walk in Tel Aviv and here now I'm Dijon, I, I found you. That's, that's for me search, or a molecule is finding a, a, another molecule. Now, in the business of quantum search, maybe you are referring to this, there's a lot of work uh, without the measurements, like Groover algorithm and things like that. Uh -huh. uh, uh, this is a different uh, class that employs the measurement. In the Groover algorithm, you have a, a purely unitary dynamics. And if you don't reach to the target, you start from the beginning with the only unitary dynamics. Mm. Uh, so, so these are two schools of thought. Uh, the Groover, uh, I would say, more famous one <laughs> uh, compared to this one. This uh, is a combination of measurements and unitaries. But uh, I, 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 my point of view is that quantum computing is important, but it's not the whole story. My question is more fundamental. Will you detect and how long? You can have your uh, interacting system, you can have disordered systems, you can have all kinds of Hamiltonians and many phenomena. Yes. Yeah, uh, I mean, if I understand correctly, you start, let's say, from, from X0, then you do a quantum evolution, and then you measure after the tau. Yes. Now, if you don't measure, what is the state after the measure? Is a superposition of all the possible states that have... It's given by the unitary and by the Hamiltonian. So the, the, this cube describes an Hamiltonian yeah. where you have jumps to nearest name. You saw the unitary and you evolve right. it unitary till here, and then you have the wave function and... That's right, it. but if you don't find it, then you collapse the wave function to what? The superposition of all the... So, so you project, and this I'll discuss now, you project, ah. you project out the measurement and... Uh, okay. Uh, uh, which means simply, if the detection is low, the wave function here is going to be zero, and you renorm renormalize the wave function. This is the postulate number five in quantum of G. Right. And if you detect it's uh, one, and then the wave function collapse here, but then you are at the end of your experiment, you begin so again. You remain with the pure state, right? I, I mean, I do it with pure states. Okay. Yes. Okay. There's no uh, bars or something like that, and yeah, pure states. You can do it also with density matrices. Uh, actually, Kruby and Bloom do that. So let us uh, start for the basics. So we get a string, and no, 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 and then a, a, a yes. Sorry. Um, a, and uh, n time tau is the random first detection time. The measure measurement collapses the wave function, putting it zero if the output is no. And we project out this xm of the state unitary until we get the click yes, and then we are happy. And uh, okay, so, um, oh, sorry. Um, so first I want to introduce the basic equation, which is our tool to solve all the problems with different Hamiltonians. And this is called uh, the quantum renewal equation. Now, there is something called the classical renewal equation. The classical renewal equation was invented by Erwin Schrodinger before he was becoming famous. And this describes basic random walks in classical first passage time. And I'm going to show that this classical idea has an analog in the quantum world. What was the idea of Schrodinger? So now I'm talking about classical stuff. Uh, let us consider a Brownian motion in uh, the plane uh, that takes time. It's a Markovian process, ordinary Brownian motion. Now, if you look at this path, let's say you started here and you end here, you can take this path and you can decompose it into two parts, one going from the starting point till the end point, and then from the end point, having a loop back to the final point. So this uh, first uh, arrival happened in some earlier time, not at some time t. So to define the motion from some initial condition to some position x, you can decompose the path into two parts. It's like me visiting Korea. I was here before, uh, let's say uh, five years ago, and then I made the loop, came back to Korea, I'm again here. Um, so uh, from this uh, basic uh, uh, idea, uh, you, you can relate between the probability, the green function to go from here to here and the statistics of the first passage time to go from here to here. And this was done uh, in classical mechanics and something similar is going to happen in quantum world, but instead of probabilities, I'm going to talk about amplitudes. And um, 
let me uh, try to uh, show you what, uh, uh, what we do. So first of all, we need to define uh, something like a, quant a, a time wave function. This is phi n. Phi n is the amplitude of the first uh, detection probability. It was uh, suggested by Abhishek Da. What is phi n? If phi n, if I take the modulus square root of it, is the probability fn. fn is the probability that you first detected in the n's measurement. That means you had n minus one no's and one yes. Uh, uh, it's an amplitude phi n, and, and you need to calculate this thing. So again, n is an index like time. It's not a wave function of space or something like that. Now, this basic uh, object we could show is given by this uh, 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 equation. And this equation here is a convolution. And what does it say? It says the following, that the amplitude of going from the initial condition, some initial condition, to XM with the new unitary dynamics, with no measurements here, is the same as going for the first time to the final state by J, and then doing this loop with the unitary. So you see it's exactly the same as the picture I had in the classical world. The difference is here I have not a probability, but I have amplitudes. So this equation is going to be important for us because with this, you can solve many things with convolution theorems. But let us look at this equation. What does it tell us? Let's say n is equal to one. Phi one is simply psi initial unitary xm. That is what you learn in undergraduate uh, quantum mechanics. The first measurement, there were, there's no influence on the outcome of it, except for the unitary. What happens again, if you plug this in here to phi two, you get the following, you get the psi initial unitary dynamics for time tau, then this projection, because you got a no in the first measurement, another unitary and xm. So of course, both this type of equation and this type are equivalent. This one, however, is useful in the following sense that we can introduce convolution theorem and get what we are interested in these phi j's. And this is done by something like Laplace transform. Uh, it's called the Z transform. Do I understand correctly that in the last uh, expression, you actually subtract uh, that it wasn't on the first uh, exactly. attempt, it's on uh, the second, okay. This is, uh, yeah, and if I had, let's say, phi three, you would have u projection, u projection, u, etc. cetera. Um, th this you can show, th th this is uh, these probabilities. Now, um, okay, so we have this and we take the Z transform in order to, uh, to look for phi j, we isolate it. Uh, this is given by, um, this thing. So this is exactly what Schrodinger did in 1915 in the classical first passage time problem. So for the simplicity of this graph, I want to consider an initial condition, which is XM. This is, you start and measure at the same point. This is just to simplify the equations. We can do it also for other initial conditions. So we can define a generating function, which is Z to the N phi N. If I know this generating function, I can invert it and get the phi n that I'm interested in. Uh, and this phi z based on this convolution uh, we had before is phi z is given by one minus this object. Now, the beauty of this uh, equation in my mind is the following. Down here, because of the unitary dynamics, we have the wave function free of any measurements. So if I know the wave function free of any measurements, I know the statistics of phi j, that's the claim here. The wave function free of any measurements, but I don't need to know it at all times. I need to know it on the times that I make the measurements. Take the Z transform of it and collapse it here. And that means that the wave function free of measurement is giving you the information on the phi j's with the measurements. And this is exactly like what Schrodinger did in 1915. He, in a classical world, you have this first passage time in Z space with discrete measurements. It's given by the probability to find the particle after N measurement again in the Z transform is equal to one, one minus this thing. And this is the probability just to occupy some state 
uh, starting at XM and ending there. So this is the green function, the Gaussian case. So you see that these two equations are exactly the same. And the general message is, if I know the, if I can solve the Schrodinger equation, if I know the unitary, I can solve and find this, if I can invert this to the real space. This is what we do. Uh, this is the technique, uh, but uh, I'm not going to show you how you do this, but uh, eventually you understand that if I can solve the Hamiltonian dynamics, I can also solve this first passage time problem. So now I'm going to discuss about uh, uh, some, some solutions that come out from this general framework. And the question now is very simple to detect or not to detect. So what we look at is the total probability of detection, sum over Fn. Will you detect the first measurement, second measurement, infinite number of measurements? This probability of detection for finite graphs in a classical world would be one. But in quantum world, this P detection is turns out it can be less than one related to dark states that I'm going to discuss uh, now. So what we find uh, using the equation from previous uh, transparency without showing the details, that the, the detection probability is given by this formula. Okay, it's an infinite sum. Um, and I want to point out, and soon I'll show you what is the meaning of this equation and how do we get it. But this uh, equation, which is very general because I don't specify what is the Hamiltonian right now, it will depend on the initial condition on the measurement uh, node. It will depend on the eigen energies of the Hamiltonian and uh, Especially, it is important to here note the degeneracy. So GL is the degeneracy of energy level uh, L. Um, now, what is interesting, or you can see really here, is that the detection probability does not depend on tau. It doesn't matter what is the time between the uh, uh, measurements. The, the, the total probability of detection is independent of it. Uh, and in fact, this equation is much more general than this proboscopic measurement. There are observables, like the average time till you detect, which can be sensitive on the time between measurements, but the other observables, which are independent. And this is one example. Another thing you see here, if they have no degeneracy in the system, the energy levels are non-degenerate, P detection is one. So, this means that there is some relation between symmetry, which gives you degeneracy, and the fact that you have P detection less than one. So symmetry gives you degeneracy, gives you P detection less than one. For example, if you have a disordered system where all the energy levels are random, uh, then you'll get P detection one, which is more or less a classical behavior for this observable, at least. Yes. So uh, you mentioned it doesn't depend on time, but tau is equal to zero, you get this quantum Zeno effect, right? Yes, yeah, so, so this is not uh, so, so tau is not uh, not equal to zero, you're absolutely correct. The, as as long as it's tau, tau, tau is epsilon here. In okay. the, because n I take to infinity before before I take tau to zero. Uh, okay, so we will talk about the zero late, a bit later, but let us see. Okay, so we have this complicated equation. Uh, we use all kinds of graph and then we see something surprising. So here is what we find uh, surprising. If very simple graphs, uh, the following. So I have here all kinds of uh, Hamiltonians, let's say the ring, and these empty spots are where I detect the particle. And I can start either here or here or here, etc. So let's say in the ring, if I start here, the probability of detection is only half, which is very bad from quantum search point of view. If I start here, it's also half, but if I start here, I get the probability of detection is one. So if I start here, eventually it will come here. If I have the cube, the nearest neighbors is one over three, and on the diagonal, it's one. If I have all connected to all, in this graph, you have one over seven to come here. And then immediately you see that this complicated equation with all these degeneracies, all these energy levels, it becomes rather simple, at least at least these examples. For example, here I have four nearest neighbors. So this is one over four. Uh, the complicated equation looks too complicated. Here I have a different case where one of the bonds is uh, different than the other. The hopping amplitude is different. And then I get one, 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 one. So this is like a disordered system once you have some disorder here, breaking the symmetry, you get the classical behavior. 
So the question we had, okay, we have an exact formula, that's great, but what are these numbers coming from? Why, why don't you detect, and why is this half? Okay, for example, why is this half? And I'll try to explain this in a simple way, uh, so you will see what's going on. And, and the reason is the following, this is a hand-waving argument that we could come up with uh, to explain the result, uh, is the following. Let's say we measure at this point, uh, but now we want to consider an initial con condition, which is a superposition of these two states, state here and state there. Uh, we claim that along your revolution, uh, you will have measurements and unitary evolution, but from the symmetry of the system, the wave function here and here must be the same for any time, uh, because there's no symmetry breaking there. And then you always have current going, oh, sorry, going into your, this doesn't work always. Do you prefer this? Oh yeah, maybe this is better. So you always have current going inside here, and then eventually you're going to detect this state. So if you start with this initial condition, and we can prove this, the detection probability is one. On the other hand, if you start like this, in a negative, negative amplitude compared to this one, no matter what, any time t, the current coming in here from here or here, of course, the wave function is going to spread, but the current coming in from these two points is going to be zero. And this is destructive interference, meaning that this initial condition can never be detected. Now, what we were showing you before is you have this initial condition, which is a superposition of these two states. This is a bright state, this is a dark state. And hence this guy we claim is half, detected with probability half. Actually, we have a bound P that is less than half. And this is what you showed, I showed you in the previous graph that if you have two nearest neighbors, which are identical with respect to the measurements, if you start here, the probability is going to be just half. And you don't need all these energy levels, eigenvalues, et cetera. It's a kind of simple argument, but it's only about. So let us uh, formulate this a little bit more. Um, let us consider a general graph. We start with an initial state, which is a combination of two states, Ri, and Rj with some phase in between them. Now, from the quantum renewal equation that uh, we described before, the amplitude of going from psi initial to xm is given by, because it's a linear, it's in all of quantum mechanics is linear, it's a linear combination of starting at Ri and starting at Rj with the initial phase. And these are uh, amplitudes of arriving at for the first time at n from these two initial conditions. And this square root of two is of course the normalizations. Now let us assume that Ri and Rj are equivalent with respect to the measurement device, which means that this amplitude and this amplitude are exactly the same. So I can replace one of them by let's say Ri. Then I can uh, square this and get the probability to go from this psi initial, again, this linear combination, and it's related, this is the linear combination. Here you have only one of the sides, uh, this Fn, and you have this phase. Now, we know that the sum of these guys has to be less than one because the sum of these guys for this very special initial condition is just the probability to be detected uh, after some time. It cannot be more than one, so it has to be less or equal to one. And th that's why, for what we are interested, the sum has to be less or equal one, then you can choose delta, the phase as it being equal zero. And then the, the P detection going from Ri to Xm is less or equal half, where the only condition is that you have another vertex in your system, Rj, which is the same as Ri from the point of view of the measurement and the Hamiltonian. So if you have some symmetry, you have this uh, bound. And this is exactly what we found. The, but didn't you say before that it can become one in your previous example where you have exactly delta right, equal zero? Right, 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 but then you didn't have two points. So let's go back. Absolutely. Do. Oh, no, no, one second. So yes. you see here. No, 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 next, next slide. Let me answer here and then I have, <laughs> Here I have two points that are equivalent with respect to this guy. Here I have one point which is respect to this guy or not so this diagonal point is one so here i have one etc now what i said in the in the next graph um 
is that in this case, I detect with probability one. In this case, I detect with probability zero. In this case, I detect with probability half because it's a linear combination of these two guys. Okay. So, so uh, the, the upper constructed interference detection is the one which you, which you showed on the next slide. Also. Yes. We, delta equals zero. Right, right. That's not. Yeah, so, so this would correspond to this state. With delta equals And then it will be equal zero here, equal one. But I'm looking at the transition Ri, Ri to XM, not, I not on the two points. I saw understanding about this, this P that it's P that is it, you said it's like it, the probability I will measure it if I at all. infinite infinite. Will I arrive in Korea? Yes or no? I can be born in Tel Aviv but not arrive here, you know. I just don't get it's possible. Get it, it's like 50% chance. It's 50 percent chance. Okay, let me explain. You do this experiment, you get no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. You get no, no, no forever, yeah. half of the times. And half of the times? And half of the times you, you get a click. But where is it, where is it coming from? It, it, it seems like it is strange because if you have- It's it, coming, this is what I tried to explain, apparently not with great success. Um, it, what is happening here is the following. I start with this case. This is a linear combination of these two. Two, two things. This is the dark state. Yeah, what, do you one second. Over initial states. What? Do you average over initial states? No, no, I don't average over initial state. But what happens is, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a bit more later, you are pushed into a dark state. You, you, by chance, sometimes you get a click, but sometimes you go into a dark state. Your system is driven by the measurements into oh. a dark state, and then you will not measure forever. Oh, I see. So. In some cases, you can your measurement be unlucky means that you will collapse the wave function in such a way that right. it arrives to a point from which you cannot get out. Right. If you don't detect ah, it after okay. five measurements, you, you are pushed into a dark state, and then the probability of getting a, a very very small. Nice. Interesting. Like interesting. Okay. Good. So um, going. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm doing a random walk. <laughs> Okay, so more generally, we consider a graph with new initial sites, all equivalent with respect to the detection and the Hamiltonian. And then we could show easily that the probability going from one of the equivalent sites to this XM is less or equal to one of the new. And this I showed now for all two, but it can be more than two, of course. So uh, let us see this. Um, but of course, what we see here is that the quantum detection is less efficient compared to a classical walk. So if we have these simple graphs, we can calculate the exact value with this complicated exact formula. Uh, and as I mentioned, one in, on, on the diagonal, it's one, here it's one over three, and you see that the bound is exact. But if you go to this tree, then uh, this symmetry bound uh, is not exact because uh, the exact value is three over five. And here you see, if you, you go from here to here, it's one. So this uh, 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 a simple bound uh, is just a bound. It's not, sometimes it's an exact bound, uh, it saturates and sometimes it's not. We actually don't know when it saturates and when it doesn't. Uh, this most likely is related to the fact that these uh, things are open here. We also have a lower bound, but I'll not go into this. Uh, so much. Um, I would like to just give you now a, a little bit broader point of view on this problem. Uh, so we did, we we calculated the p detection, but uh, some general ideas about this is unknown to other people. In quantum mechanics, I discovered many things unknown. <laughs> I'm not the first guy, of course, and this is related to something called uh, Zemo subspaces. So let us talk about this briefly. So. Zeno a paradox or effect is well known. So let's say we have a graph and then I measure very quickly. Then if you think about it a little bit, uh, uh, because uh, the leakage of the probability, the wave function increases like tau, but the probability of measurement is tau squared. Then the following is well known from the time of uh, Alan Turing, I think. Uh, if you go from here to here, and you measure very quickly, this is going to be a dark state. You will never measure it. If you, you start here, you'll never measure it. If you start here again, but if you start here 
and you measure here, you will of course detect in the first measurement because that is uh, uh, obviously true and the limit of tau equals zero. So what you see in this case is that you have initial states which are dark and one state, if you start here and measure here, it's bright. So the Hilbert space is divided into two. And this is well known in the tau limit, small tau limit, but what we are doing here, tau not equal zero, is that there is an interference and the Hilbert space is divided into two parts, one of them bright and one of them dark. So here the bright and dark were the local bases. And here the bright and dark are energy bases that I'll soon discuss. Now this claim is highly non-trivial because the Hilbert space is divided into either bright states or dark states, but not into gray states. Gray states would be a state that is detected with some probability. So th there is a basis, energy basis, where you are either here or there. This is true only for finite systems. If you have infinite systems, you, you also have gray states. So let us explain what is the meaning of this bright and dark subspace um, with which we can get the exact formula that I showed you before on the detection. So the, the bright and dark states uh, are detected with probability one or zero. That's the definition of a bright and dark state. And the Hilbert space can be decomposed into dark and bright uh, space spaces. And um, in the rapid measurement, this is just the zero limit, as I just mentioned now. Um, and these dark states are related to degeneracy and hence to symmetry. So how do we understand what is a dark state? Uh, let us consider two energy states, E1 and E2, which have the same energy. That's important, so they are degenerate. Now let us construct a new state, which is also an, eigen an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, with these coefficients here and here. Now, what you see here is xm e2, and here you have xm e1. Now, if you project it on the measured state xm, this is obviously going to be zero. So this state is obviously dark for any time t because the amplitude on xm is always zero. So the message here is the following. If I have two energy levels, which are degenerate, and this is related to the symmetry I showed you before, I can construct a dark state uh, forever. So this is true no matter how I choose E1 and E2, right? I mean, E1 and E2 are degenerate. E1 and E2 have to be degenerate, but uh, I, them as I, wish. I can do that as I wish. It's easy to take two of them. And then now if we have some manifold with GA levels, you will uh, have more states like this. It would be some kind of Grand Schmidt procedure. Okay. And this is what I'm going to do this. Now, now I'm going to show you this uh, in a second. Uh, but you know, these ideas about dark states, they are of course not mine. Uh, Alan Turing, uh, small tau limit, uh, etc. I would like to mention Plenio and uh, Knight that did it in the context of light harvesting systems. Uh, there are many people who worked on these dark states. Uh, I think also Sengju here knows about this. The expert knows about these dark states. We only calculated the detection probability and related it to symmetry. That's what we did. Uh, uh, but going into this uh, philosophy that I just showed you, so let us see, have a gen general system with um, degeneracy. This is G. This is a non-degenerate state. This has five degeneracies, eight degeneracies. What we could prove uh, with the detection measurement is that and from a degenerate state, we can compose one bright state that is detected with probability one and seven dark states. And you start with what I just showed you, and then you will go to orthogonal states by Grau Schmidt. Once you do all these dark states for the whole system, then you can calculate the detection probability because the detection probability uh, is simply the bright states times the psi initial squared that gives you the formula I gave you before, which again, why is this one over two or one over three or one over four? You cannot uh, immediately see, but it's the same thing. This happens from the calculation. Okay, so, oh, I'm very slow today, but it's, I think it's okay, but this is just an introduction. Uh, so um, let us discuss. The fact that the probabilities are always so nice, like one over two, one over four, and so on, it's a, it's a, 
It's a consequence of the of the symmetry, right? <laughs> it, 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 it's it's the consequence it. of uh, simply that you, you need to count how many exactly. uh, sides are equivalent with respect to the measurement. Exactly. And now it's also because I like in seminars to talk about simple things. So these are integer numbers. And now I'm going to show you another integer number, which is uh, even more beautiful in my opinion. So uh, unfortunately, it, it was discovered before me. So, but it's very beautiful work of Grunbaum and company. But we elaborate on it. So I'll talk about it a little bit. Now we, we saw that, okay, if I start here and measure here, then the detection probability is less than one. But um, let us say uh, we start here and measure here. So this is the return problem. And once you have a return in quantum mechanics, you have some topology and you have some phases and it's going to be interesting. This is a very special case, but very interesting case where you start and measure at the same point. Well, you can calculate the generating function. This is given by this awful expression here. And then you can calculate, uh, because you start here and measure here, P detection is one. Uh, you detect with probability one, but now you can calculate something new. Let's calculate the average time till you detect. Anyone wants to get guess what is the average time for this system? Okay, I'll show. Six, well, that's a very good guess. I, I, I salute you, but it's not six. <laughs> The answer is four. Independent on what is gamma tau. Now, this is a, a very beautiful result. If I don't start and measure at the same point, let's say I start at uh, one of the other lattice points, and let's say detection probability is one, the average n will be very sensitive to this tau. So you get here this four. Anyone wants to guess? This is for the ring of size six. What is this for? It's the number of energy levels which are non degenerate because the ring of size six has four energy levels. This beautiful uh, observation was made by Grunbaum and Werner, uh, and they made the claim that the average n is quantized. Uh, you see it's four most of the time. Um, and it's related to this effective dimension of the Hilbert space, which is the number of energy levels. By the way, going back to your uh, question, if I measure the X position and do the same thing for the return, the answer will be six. So whoever said six, the answer is correct, but for a different model. Okay, so- Is this the time or- Well, average N, average N times tau is the average time till you get the click. So average N is the number of measurements. After four measurements on average, you get click yes. Okay. Oh, so it's yeah. like the time because I multiply by yeah, time. Yeah, I get it. Again, this is a, as a function of gamma tau. Gamma, remember, is the hopping amplitude between the number of steps. By the way, if I had the ring and the slightest degeneracy that will remove the degeneracy, instead of this four, I'll get the six. So again, in, in an only perfect world, if you remove degeneracy, you will change this average. N. Now, in addition to this number four, there is a special sampling times tau where you get one, three, two, but always an integer number. And this one is very uh, obvious. If tau goes to zero or is zero actually, then you start and measure at the same point. Then after the first measurement, you get a clip. That's obvious because you cannot escape. This is the zero limit. Now here, there is something interesting. If tau is small, the, but not zero, the average is four. What does this mean? You start on this uh, a ring. Usually, you detect after the first measurement because you started there, and after a short time, you measure, and most of the amplitude is there. Usually, you get a click, but once in a while, a rare event, you do not detect the particle there. And then you collapse the wave function on the initial state, and then it's somewhere else in the system. Now, you're continuing measuring, but you are in the Zeno limit. So what, usually you get one, sometimes you get a huge number, infinity and the limit tau to zero. The average of infinity and one is four. This is not trivial, but this is, now this is related to topology. What do I mean by topology? I mean two things. First of all, you see that the result is more or less uh, in these regimes at least is not sensitive to the parameters of the model. That's a kind of protected thing. Secondly, the generating function is rotating. This I'm just telling you. 
And the number of rotations of the generating function in uh, when you take Z to E I theta is exactly this number. Now, the fact that let's say here, you have these transitions in the topology means that, uh, for example, here, I said you either measure after a long time or after a short time, usually after a short time, but some rare events after a very long time, means that the fluctuations around these transitions are gigantic. And we actually analyze these fluctuations and we can calculate them and uh, uh, we worked on them. I don't know how much time I have. Um, so let me discuss a little bit about quantum computers. So uh, you, you can do, do these experiments today on quantum computers. Uh, I do it with, uh, uh, these are experiments by Sabine Tono and Klaus Ziegler. We are co collaborating with them. And uh, here we see this effect uh, on a quantum computer. Here, tau is fixed, but we change gamma, but that is the same as the previous uh, graph. And here you see the topology, uh, the average N is two most of the time. And, but you have these jumps. And of course, next to these jumps, these are special values where you have a kind of revivals of the wave function. And then you have a jump in this case to one. And this is because, uh, so you either one, oh, sorry. You either one or zero with noise, of course. And okay, we have all kinds of uh, issues with noise. The number of measurements is not infinity in the quantum computer. You cannot measure an infinite amount of time. We measure only 40 times. So there is some noise. And you see here, this topological number is two. And this is because this, uh, this system, uh, the Hilbert space, the effective dimension of the Hilbert space was two. We are trying to increase it, but to increase this in a quantum computer turns out to be very hard because the quantum computers are very noisy today. Uh, so this is a, the first demonstration in a kind of experiment or quasi experiment on the cloud of this uh, effect. And then if you, sorry, if you look at the fluctuations, the average, and every time you have a jump in the topology, you have huge fluctuations. These are these places uh, that you have these uh, uh, gigantic fluctuations. Now, I think I should summarize, right? I mean, uh, oh, we'll a couple of minutes more, I don't know. Couple or, okay, couple. <laughs> well, make, make a suggestion, I don't know. Okay, I mean, uh, it depends on your style. Um, How much time do you need? I can have whatever you say. I'm uh, a polite guy, too polite. I don't know, let's go. Um, let me just briefly say uh, that uh, how do we analyze, uh, sorry, I, I'll try to sum su summarize. I just want to say that if you are interested to go into the details of this, there is a beautiful way to solve and approach these problems with the classical charge theory. I'm going to state the classical charge theory without proving anything. You see, I'm a classical guy. It's easier for me to think about classical problems than quantum problems. Uh, there, there are many uh, uh, first passage time problems. You map them into an electrostatic problem. And here you can do the same. Uh, the idea comes from Grunbaum uh, again. So this is an example of a, a system with uh, five energy levels. What you do is you calculate the energy levels of the system and you put charges on the unit disk. So this comes from the values of the energies times tau. Here you have charges. What are these charges? These PKs, these are uh, the overlaps of the detected state with the same energy level. And you have these charges. Now all these charges are positive. They are actually wires, infinite wires coming out. So these are these log, 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 log uh, potentials. And inside the unit disk, you have stationary solutions of, the, of these charges. These are points where the forces are zero, classical forces. These points are um, eigenvalues of the important param uh, operator in this system, which is going back, this operator, the survival operator. The survival operator is the unitary times the detection. So what we have at the beginning, we have phi n, we have this survival operator, the unitary times the collapse, unitary times collapse, n minus one times. This is the 
negative measurements one year out. So the eigenvalues of this operator, which are of course not on the unit disk because, because of the measurement, they are inside the unit disk. If I know the eigenvalues of this guy, this is how we can also solve the problem. And uh, th this is the technique. And if I can map it onto this chart picture, I can get a lot of insights from the classical world on the quantum world. I'll give you one insight um, or two insights. So this was very brief. So for example, let's assume that two charges, uh, they, they kind of meet or, or converge on the unit disk. What does this mean? That you are approaching a degenerate state. You are changing the topology. What will happen is that one of the eigenvalues will go to the unit disk and disappear. That is related to the fact that we had this jump in the, in the topological number because the number of these guys is the topological number that we are approaching. Now, if two guys are merging here and what this eigenvalue is approaching, in the long time limit, we can calculate only this guy because the other guys will describe the short time dynamics, so to say, this is going to describe the long time dynamics. And then we can estimate this. And from this, this guy is going to be dominating. For example, it's dominating the variance. So merging charges, which just means uh, the degeneracy is approaching in the classical world versus the, the quantum world. Uh, and then uh, uh, you can have um, weak charges. You have three charges coming together. But now I want to end with uh, something which is a kind of general, and that is a uh, time energy uncertainty principle. So very briefly, let's assume that you are a, a, all your charges, this is approaching the zero limit. All the charges are in the half, upper half plane. Now, they form a convex hull. And the eigenvalues of the survival operator have to be somewhere inside here. You don't know where because you don't know what are the charges. Now, I can take a, a lower bound on the absolute value of the size, and this is this distance here. It's very easy. Now, if I know this distance, I can calculate the variance of the fluctuations of n. And th this is, uh, we can bound it by this distance. It's very simple. And then in the limit of small tau, we could prove the uh, uncertainty principle. And that is delta E squared, delta T squared, delta T is N times tau squared, uh, is greater than eight, eight comes from the calculation, W minus one H bar squared. So this is an uncertainty principle, but it's very different than the usual time energy uncertainty principles you are used to. The reason is this delta T, which is the fluctuation till the first click, it is really fluctuating because in, in the ordinary quantum mechanics, time is not fluctuating. So this is a fluctuating quantity based on your measurement because time is random. The first click is random. So this is real, a real variance. Delta E is the difference between the E max and the E mean in this problem. This is the delta E squared. What is this W? This W is the winding number, which is the average N. So you have here a relation is a time energy uncertainty pressure, which is related also to the topology here. And why is this W here, W minus one? Assume you have a quantum system with one state only. If you have a quantum system with one state only, you measure it after one measurement, it's trivial. So omega minus one, if W with the effective dimension of the Hilbert space is one, you get a zero, there's no uncertainty in delta T. So this is a, a kind of an uncertainty-like relation that we could derive, uh, and uh, it, it relates, again, the average n of w to this fluctuation of the time till you detect the particle. This was just on the, uh, uh, there are many more results, but uh, I, we should stop now. Uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eli, for this very interesting talk. There's time for questions. Yes, Henning, please. Hi. Um, so I'm more like a quantum, right? <laughs> well, my question is, um, I'm interested in the complex phases if you had a magnetic field. Oh. So for instance, when you had these numbers for um, uh, right. these other integers, if I have a pi flux, I would get three. 
Uh, if I have uh, average point magnetic field, I always would have six. Yes. Uh, well, uh, it, first of all, we consider this problem in one of our problem, one of our papers. Um, uh, you you need to choose also smartly your observables. So not you, you're talking about the average n, right? Uh, but you can choose other observables which you see magic when you scan the magnetic field. Uh, for example, the transition problem, you start at point one, you go to zero. Now, with respect to what you said, that most of the time you will get this, uh, this integer like before, but you have special Bs where you have these jumps in the topological numbers because you have two types of, uh, so, to say, so to say, degeneracies. One is real degeneracies of the energy levels, and one is a, a, a degeneracy of not of the energy levels, but of the phases. It, Exponential i e one tau equal exponential i e two tau and e two and e one are not the same. So there are special taus where things merge, and this is related to the two charges merging on the unit disk. And then you have a jump in the topological number and fluctuations and all kinds of interesting things. So you, if you choose tau correctly, you can get interesting stuff uh, and jumps and all kinds of things. Thanks. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for nice talk. So I, I actually couldn't ask any question because there are so many questions that I think about. But let me just I mean, kind of two things. One, I mean, I, I guess you talked about measuring only one place, but right. what if you actually extend it, maybe half of the point? Right. And the other thing is also theoretically it's possible to extend this to more open system quantum dynamics. Right. So is there any work or do you have any plan? For so, okay, so about the types of measurements, uh, I mentioned a little bit when you measure the position operator, for example, yeah. did this. Um, you can measure, a, let's say, a few of these guys together. Uh, actually, we have some work on this, uh, for example, uh, and then there is another issue. Uh, let's say you want to do an interacting system. So you have, let's say, a spin system and you just measure one of the spins. So you are not detecting a state in the Hilbert space. Because, okay. uh, you so, so there you could prove, for example, uh, that the average n for the return problem is a ratio of two numbers. Uh, it can be a fraction, it's not an integer. Okay. The, 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 there's many, many games to be played here. So depending on your measurement, and uh, if you are in many body setting, what is the measurement? And uh, there, there are some comparisons. Now, with respect to noise, uh, we, we have some, uh, in, in the last part, which I didn't talk about, is that we designed special graphs, special Hamiltonians that are here, it doesn't mean much for you, where the search is very quick and very efficient. This is related to Dirac physics. And then we added uh, to this kind of noise to see how this noise uh, uh, kills the destructive interference and the fast measurements. But a, a real coupling to a heat bath with temperature T, and of course, coupling to a heat bath can mean many things. I would say not much is known. Uh, for example, uh, this topological number four, if I couple it to a heat bath, I assume that it will jump to six. Uh, or you see, you see, uh, it, it's not known. Uh, yeah, the uh, reason how, I'm asking that is, at some point, you still see, you see, you see the transition from quantum to classical. Right. Right, right, right. So th this is why I believe that if you have the this topological number, I believe if you have a, enough noise and you wait long enough, okay. Um, so so the average n you should understand in different ways. I mean, in, in real experiments you have uh, n times f n, but you don't measure for fifty million uh, measurements, right? So what I believe that if you have noise that at the beginning, this will go to four, but after some long time, it will go to six. Actually, we know this happens because I did these experiments on the quantum computer. So uh, I mentioned in the quantum computer, we measure, let's say, four, 40 times. But if you go to bigger systems, you see that it overshoots because the measurements themselves introduce some noise and uh, we are debating is the noise due to the measurements or is it due to the dynamics, the unitary dynamics? And our conclusion for the quantum computers we are using is that the, the noise comes from the measurement itself and not so much from the unitary. But that 
that is very specific for, for this machine. Um, the, the measurements in the quantum computers are, are bad. And the reason is that they introduced the measurements into the quantum computers only in the last year or so. While the unitaries uh, you can do on the quantum computers, I think, for many years already. So they, they, they are, they are, the engineers are working on improving these measurements and things like that. Okay. More questions? Yes, please. Um, it seems that the setup seems very similar to what I've seen, you know, a few years back. It's called the Aiden Park Markov models. Mm -hmm. They also exactly it's you know this kind of situation where you start with some initial state and then use uh, let's say couple it to a third system, make a projective measurement on the like the, this ancilla system, which results in a is in like general class operation on the on your system qubit. Right. So, so it's basically like a map of you know stochastic dynamics, like quantum stochastic dynamics on the system qubit while having outputs. So maybe that like connecting with that literature might uh, yeah well I didn't mention but you're absolutely correct there's a huge literature today on the combination of unitaries and measurements and the effect right. on things like entanglement um what what we do as far as I know I mentioned a few not only me but the group of people I mentioned from Ambiana and we we look at the first the statistics of the first click while most of the the other people that I know um in the condensed matter phase, they, they 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 look at many. First of all, they look at big systems. We, mm -hmm. I don't believe in this so much at this current moment in history of time, <laughs> uh, because it's very hard to measure this uh, at least on quantum computers. We look at big systems, and the measurements are all over the place, and they don't stop the measurements for the first click. They are not not, not looking for the first time. They are looking for the influence of the measurement on the system. Yeah. And uh, there, are, there are hundreds of beautiful work. Uh, yeah, the system continues to develop after the measurement. It, in other people's work, not in my no, work. But uh, how is it? No, but a quantum collapse. So it's a new initial condition. Because uh, they don't measure, like, uh, for, example, for example, imagine, let's say, a spin system. Um, and you, you don't measure, uh, so the, the, the spin spin, let's say you have the 20 spins. You don't measure a state of the spin systems. You measure one of the spins here, one of the spins there. So you're not fully collapsing. It's a yeah, partial kind, measurement. Kind of it's a, not the same thing. Kind of a weak measurement. Absolutely. Yeah, and other people do weak. So many people are the, the general. Uh, I think the general theme here of all these people, <laughs> even though people are doing different things, is simply because of maybe these quantum computers, when you evolve, you measure, you can, but you can measure many things, and then you want to know the back reaction. We have a special path to calculate the hitting time, but other people do, you know, you can do this for disordered system. Uh, Yuval Geffen does it for disordered systems, uh, repeated measurements, but the measurements are all over the place. So there are many ways to do measurements, and that's the short answer. <laughs> So, yeah, in these quantum micro models, they are mostly interested in what is kind of the limit state after a, right. you know infinitely many, and they also find something exactly we mentioned these like dark states. Exactly, is yeah. that if you have the general Hamiltonians, then there is a single like limiting state. Right, if right. you don't, then you can have for different initial states. You have different limits. Right. You you drive the system through measurements and unitary to some unique states. Right, right. So I think there's like a. Lots it's related of between these fields, yeah. Yeah, there is some overlap, but uh, I agree there is overlap. Yes, it's it's a good thing. I'm not lonely. <laughs> <laughs> There's some yeah, general interest. But absolutely correct. You said that you are not uh, projecting, but you do. I mean, as long as you have a negative uh, the outcome, you project and continue, right? Yeah, yeah. I project and so continue. You, so you do. Yeah, I mean. Uh, it's only that when you uh, get a right. positive measurement, right. then you right. stop. Yes, yes. Right. What happens uh, when uh, when you have uh, uh, larger types of the, um, the, of the generacies in your system? So, so I, I mean, you don't you, you mentioned the generacies and how all these. Uh, so I mean, the the the, the, the theorem uh, is valid for any type of degeneracies. Um, in principle, I mean, of course, when you go to large systems on the quantum computers, nothing works, but. Um, we, we, we can, uh, in principle, work with any type of degeneracy. We are this all connected to all uh, graphs. And so 
of course, the, the more degenerate you are, so to say, the more equivalent sites you are, the detection probability in the first part goes down and down and down. Um, maybe I should mention here um, this nice work, in my opinion, of Plenum and Night. They, 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 they were interested in light harvesting system before us, and they considered a ring. And what is the connection of light harvesting systems, which is important in the biochemistry, of course, so this problem is that you have the excitation from the photon, some excitation of the, on the ring. That is the kind of physicist approach to the light harvesting systems. They seem to know more, much more about this than me. And then uh, this energy is transported to some center, which is like the measurement in my case. And they, they advance this idea that these light harvesting systems have to have some, uh, disorder in order for the transfer to be faster. Now, for me, this was very exciting because I sit in many colloquiums and seminars of condensed matter people, sorry. And they always tell me, under cell localization, if you have disorder, it's very bad for transport. What Plenio and I say that is actually correct, but for the detection itself, not for the time for the detection, the disorder is good because it kills the dark states. Of course, you are not allowed to have too much disorder because then you have Anderson localization and nothing will go. So a little disorder, not too strong, not too weak. They did it on the ring. And it's a nice, a uh, very nice insight in my point of view, whether or not it's related to real system like a light arm system, I don't know, but we also see it here that the removal of degeneracy will make the detection more classical, P detection will go to one. Yes, Dominic. And again, uh, so there is this thing called anti zeno effect, right? When if you have a certain, in some systems, when you have certain like uh, delta or tau, tau time of measurement, you can actually speed up the evolution. Have you observed something? Uh, like no, I'm not an expert on this, no, but uh, maybe we should talk about this now. I see, okay. Uh, yeah, I know this. Uh, I heard about this effect, but no, we didn't consider this. Mm -hmm. There is some work uh, of Abhishek Dar recently. He, 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 if you want to search quickly, the intuition is measure a lot because then you'll, you'll detect, right? Well, why not? If your child gets lost, you don't wait till <laughs> between measurements, you measure all the time, right? So what he said is that uh, you can have a, a Zeno limit, maybe it was also said before, so let's say you have this uh, kind of graph and then you have small tau limit. If you compensate this by some hopping amplitude that goes uh, to be very large and related to the tau, in a special way, you can get rid of the zeno limit by a coupling related to the time between measurements. Uh, and then you don't have any zeno limit at all. But in our case, the hopping rate, which we should call gamma, was fixed and not related to tau. So we didn't take these two limits together. But I don't know about the getting rid of the zeno limit. Yeah. Okay, more questions? If not, uh, then uh, let's uh, let's thank Eli again. Thank you very much. Uh, Eli will be here for maybe another hour and for another week in Pohang if you want to meet him. In, if you want to measure him in Korea and not somewhere else in this world. Very good.